Sue Husari, who grew up in California, describes herself as a native San Franciscan. She credits her early love for the outdoors to those memorable hiking and backpacking experiences she shared with her father in the Sierra Nevada mountains. Sue holds a degree in botany from Humboldt State University. She has worked for both the U.S. Forest Service and the National Park Service. Her various positions range from working on a Klamath National Forest Brush Disposal Crew to serving as the fire management officer in the Everglades National Park. In 1976, Sue was selected as one of the nation's first women hotshot crew members while serving on the Lassen Hotshot Crew. She is currently the Regional Fire Management Officer for the Pacific West region of the National Park Service. Sue Hasari likes to describe how she learned to use landscape patterns, including soil maps, to predict fire behavior. As you listen to Sue describe her process, note the number of ways she cross-links various chunks of environmental information to form her analysis of patterns. I spend quite a bit of time on fires, uh, looking at the land, not looking at the fire, but looking at the landscape and looking at how the vegetation patterns change and trying to visualize how the fire is going to move through that landscape, you know, in, in concert with uh, the weather that's predicted. So in reading the landscape, I think it takes patience. Um, it's quite, for me, it's very intuitive. I use some, I always use some base information, uh, especially as soil maps and veg maps are really useful. So you need some kind of basic information about what the substrate is like that you can't see. Soil maps are pretty useful in terms of understanding what the potential for the vegetation is on the landscape, if you know a little bit about soils and uh, what could be there, what is there, and what's likely to happen. And that's more in the successional thing about, uh, but a lot of the, the reason I had to learn that is because a lot of the systems I worked in originally, um, there's not any dendrochronology. You know, you can't get fire history off of tree trunks. So you have to develop a skill for looking at the patterns on the landscape, and you can easily mistake uh, changes that are just simply due to soil differences for a fire pattern if you don't have a soils map. So if they're, especially in chaparral, if there, here's a good example, if there's a patch of chemise, low chemise, next to a patch of um, heavy brush, you might think that was because there was a fire and the chemise came back. And sometimes that's true, but a lot of times it's strictly because there's a very poor soil there that that is the limits of what can um, grow on that site. So uh, it takes a lot of practice. A lot of times I take fire history maps to the field and then try to compare them. So you could take the fire history map if there is one, and that's when it's a lot easier to the field, and compare the fire history map to what you see and then calibrate your brain to recognize that same pattern again. And that's what I mean about developing visual acuity. I have very good distance, I have really good eyesight. I have like 20, 15 eyesight. So I can see a lot of things other people can't at a distance, which I try to, I can't see, obviously I wear reading glasses up close now, but I could still have good distance vision. I'm really good with birds and all that kind of stuff. So um, you have to calibrate your eye to the landscape, figure out what is the disturbance pattern or the uh, slope percentage or whatever it is, uh, the substrate that makes things look like that. There's both the texture name. and color that can help you see things. I got good at this at Everglades because it's an incredibly uniform, very, very uniform landscape. Most people can't map fires in Everglades. You have to develop a sense for color and texture that just trends. I think it's true in Alaska, too, if you want to find where you are. Because we didn't have, we had the Loran Sea, and it was good within, you know, <laughs> they said 60 feet. But you had to be able to map off aerial photos, usually. But I, you have to recognize these. Well, Everglades is made up of these om, oblong patterns of saw, a lot of it, sawgrass and another um, 
another type of uh, swamp grass. And you have to be able to recognize that this pattern of little tree islands, like you look for three in a row or two over there and one there from the map, and then be able to transpose that visually to uh, what you're looking at from a, usually from the air. Uh, and I, I really trained myself. There's so many fires there, and I did a lot of mapping because I don't get air sick. So there'll be a pattern of tiny tree islands, and you can, it's like looking at constellations, very, very similar at stars. You're looking for a pattern so you can find out where you are in the sky, and then you go from that distinct pattern that you recognize and extrapolate out to where you are or back and then you can map. And that is, it was the hardest place I've ever done mapping, it, except in heavily smoky conditions, which is also really difficult. You can see on the aerial photos these patterns, and you can find, and I taught a lot of people how to map there. Everybody can learn it. The only people that I found really couldn't are people that are colorblind. They had a really, either, people that get air sick had a really tough time because you go round and round and round and round and round, and it's pretty bumpy, you know, there mm -hmm. because of the turbulence, uh, you know, the, the amount of instability. But um, people that are colorblind and people that get air sick, I mean, everybody can do That's some okay. things well, and you just don't pick those people because it would be torment for them to try to do it. Yeah. Patience is another important quality for that kind of work. Well, I don't want to not give somebody credit, but I actually do think I learned it on my own. But I learned how I had a really nice 19th century education at Humboldt State University. <laughs> you know, a lot of taxonomy. I had some very good professors that were uh, really interested in ecological pattern at a variety of scales. And so I had a lot of good education about that. And it was a good basis for this kind of work that I did later. The, um, and I worked for some really good intuitive firefighters uh, that just kind of, they knew what the fire was going to do. And I was fascinated by those kind of people that could predict what the fire was going to do. Uh, not fire behavior analysts necessarily, but people that had learned it because they had a lot of experience and because it's key to, sur it was key to surviving you know, out on a lot of fires before we had, uh, we didn't have particularly good communication or they'd leave you out for a really long time. Mark Tucker, the president of the National Center on Education and the Economy, has said this of creativity. One thing we know about creativity is that it typically occurs when people who have mastered two or more quite different fields use the framework in one to think afresh about the other. Intuitively, you know this is true. Leonardo da Vinci was a great artist, scientist, and inventor, and each specialty nourished the other. He was a great lateral thinker. But if you spend your whole life in one silo, you will never have either the knowledge or mental agility to do the synthesis, to connect the dots, which is usually where the next great breakthrough was found. Think about how Suasari has painstakingly developed the keen ability to connect the dots between different fields of knowledge. This veteran fire management officer is not only concerned with solely the fire spread and intensity models for basing her fire forecasts, she deftly mixes her observations of the fire environment by including the patterns of texture, color, and soil structure too. All of which, as Sue thankfully reminds us, are also important facets to the complex fire environment.